<laughs> Hope you can see what the student pastor's church team is so excited about bringing uh, Pastor Casey as a candidate for you today. We're very excited about the potential of him being our next student pastor. I want us to pray together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for just how you work and, Lord, bringing Pastor Casey, Lord, to us. Who we get to vote to call him to be a student pastor. And God, I pray you lead us in that. And God, those we move into your word, Lord, may we hear from you. God, may we be still and may you speak. May we respond to you in a way that pleases you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, text messages can be confusing. Uh, sometimes you send a text message and it gets you in trouble. Sometimes you send a text message, you mean one thing, and someone else hears something else. Ever happened to you? Yeah. I sent a text message last Sunday to Pastor John and Pastor Michael. It said some stuff before this and some stuff after this, but in the text message, these were the exact words I sent to those, or to uh, Pastor Michael and Pastor John. It's this. The church I went to today had no power. It was actually a really good service. Felt kind of bad for them, though. Exact text message. Now, here's what I was trying to convey in that text message. I had went to, uh, we were visiting with the in-laws in Waleska, Georgia. I had attended First Baptist Canton, and they had no electrical power. I mean, they had no lights, they had no amplification, they had no screens. Um, the, the musician, he, he, he was on a piano, and he, like, he would play a tune, and if you knew it, you'd sing a little bit, and then he'd change to another tune. I mean, she's like, it was like karaoke on a piano. It was kind of cool. And then the pastor, I mean, you had to sit up near front. Some of you, it would have killed you. You had to sit near front to hear him. And he preached from the glow of an iPad. Psalm 1, I mean, he nailed it. It was a great service, but it had no electrical power. The power was out at First Baptist Canton. I was trying to convey to Pastor Michael, Pastor John, it had no electrical power. Apparently, Pastor Michael, being more spiritual, <laughs> thought I was saying something else. I found out later in the office, they were messing with me. So how did you know they had no spiritual power in the service? Did you just not like the songs they sang? Did not do it for you? He heard I was diagnosing the temperature of the church, no spiritual power, but it wasn't what I was trying to say. You know, it is a nuisance to not have power. Thank God for amplification. Uh, thank God for the screens and that you can see us. Um, today, but more than a nuisance of not having electrical power, Pastor Michael's messing with me has got me thinking how sad it is to gather together and not have the spirit moving, to have no spiritual power. How sad it is when God is not moving in our own lives. And so I want to look today at a spiritual discipline that goes very, very tightly with what Pastor Ryan preached last Sunday about reading our Bibles and Bible reading plans. Let's look at a spiritual discipline that I believe if you feel far from God, if you feel like maybe you're not effective as you once were, if you're not feeling the Spirit's conviction, if God's not moving in your heart, this might be a spiritual discipline that God's saying um, you need to ramp up in your life. Let's look at that together. We're going to look at prayer. So if you have your Bibles, open it with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. I remind you that we are walking the book of Luke. We've been walking the book of Luke well over a year. And we're going to ramp it up some. We're going to finish this book of Luke this year. So we're going to look at it on Sunday morning and Sunday night. We'd love you to be here on Sunday night with us. Um, and so we're going to be walking through the book of Luke. Um, and we'll finish it this year. Um, I also want to remind you on our, on our church app, you can look there and follow along with the notes from this sermon as well there. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Here's what God's word says. He was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, whenever you pray, say. Now the next part of the prayer that Jesus teaches is what we affectionately call the Lord's Prayer. Some call it the Disciples Prayer. Um, and I want us just to read that together. And since there's so many translations we carry, uh, I'm going to honor Eddie Paul and read from the New King James Version, okay? And uh, why don't you say it with me? Can we do that? Okay. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. When we come to our, our text, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. And yet, this prayer that we look at today, some have turned that into a magic prayer. I've said, you know, if things are tough, let's just, let's, let's, let's say this prayer as if, if it's, if it's, as if it is magic words. I remember uh, one time a guy, it was a tough situation, he said, all right, preacher, give us an Our Father. I looked at him, I don't know what an Our Father is. And I finally, oh, he wants me to, he wants me to say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I was at a home uh, recently in the past month. It was a tragic situation. Um, somebody committed suicide and the family was grieving. I went to offer counsel, and it was too early. They didn't want to hear any words, and so I offered to pray with them. So we, we stood in the family room, uh, hands in hands, in a circle, praying. After I finished, uh, one of the uh, individuals there with the family said, can I pray too? Love it. And, she, and then she recited the Lord's Prayer. And I loved her heart of wanting to offer comfort and pray. But my question to you, is this just the magic words that Jesus wants us to recite, or is these principles of how we should approach God? And I want to present to you, I believe there's nothing wrong with reciting these. I think it's good to recite these words sometimes, to pray this prayer to God. But, but I would present, this, these are not magic words, but these are principles of how we are to approach King Jesus. And tonight, we're going to go through these principles and, and look at what that means in our prayer life specifically. But, to, but this morning, I want us to look at generalities, look at the questions the disciples asked Jesus. One of the disciples came to Jesus and asked the question, Lord... Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I want you to be honest with you and just make an observation. Prayer is not something that we come to naturally. I don't believe that you're born a good prayer. Uh, Praying isn't something you're just born with and and out comes, oh, good prayers. The reality is we are born rotten sinners. And when we are born in our sin, prayer seems foreign to us. Uh, For those who don't know Jesus, it might seem awkward spending time talking to God or listening to God in prayer. And yet prayer, when God grabs your heart, when God saves you, you see the great benefit of prayer. It draws you closer. It tunes your heart with God's heart. And yet prayers work. I agree with Martin Luther who says, prayer is the hardest work of all. There's no greater work than praying. It's hard work that Christians, we ought to endeavor with together. And if you today want to grow in your prayer life, I think one way is to pray with a prayer warrior. When you pray with someone who's got some prayer muscles, someone who who, who has, um, I just like to call them prayer warriors. You got a prayer warrior in your family? Man, my mama is a prayer warrior. When you pray with prayer warriors, man, their their prayers, uh, their prayer life, it, it overflows into your prayer life and helps you to grow. Another way to to grow in your prayer life is to join us for prayer week. I think if you join us for prayer week, if we pray with others, I think God will, God can help you grow in your prayer life. Another way that I found at times to grow in my prayer life is to journal my prayers. I'm not much of a journal, but when you journal your prayers, it helps you to, to think, and to focus, and to tune your heart to God's heart. See, there is something different about Jesus' prayer life than the disciples' prayer life. They noticed there was a difference in Jesus' prayer life. So the disciples come to them and say, Lord... Teach us to pray. They ask that question because prayer is not something that comes naturally to us. And they ask that question. They ask, Lord, teach us to pray. They made that statement because prayer was in the habit of Jesus' life. We see in verse 1, what was Jesus doing before they asked Jesus? Well, Jesus, the Bible says, was praying in a certain place. Now, we don't know the place. It's a certain place. But he was praying. All throughout the book of Luke, we see 21 different times, Luke, more than any other gospel writer, Luke wants you not to miss this truth. Jesus often prayed. Luke talks about Jesus withdrawing from the disciples, withdrawing from the crowds to pray, praying all night long, going up into the mountain to pray. Luke talks about specific, hard crisis moments in Jesus' life, often before decisions, Jesus prayed. Before, uh, after he's baptized, in the temptation, he's praying. When he selects disciples, he's praying. Before the Mount of Transfiguration, he's praying. And before he goes to die on the cross for your sins and my sins, what's he doing? He's praying. We see that? And notice what the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. We don't see anywhere in Scripture. 
scripture where the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to speak like you speak. I present to you the greatest preacher ever is King Jesus. I mean, to be there at Sermon on the Mount, man, that would have been awesome. But they didn't ask him to teach us to speak like you speak. They don't ask him to help us to counsel like you counsel. They don't even ask him, Lord, help us to do miracles like you do miracles. But they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. They noticed there was something different about the prayers of Jesus than their own prayers. I agree with R.C. Sproul who says, praying is a ministry secret. If we look at the ministry of Jesus or you look at the ministry of Luther or Calvin or Augustine or any of the great Christians throughout the ages, the connecting link, those who are powerful in ministry are those who are earnest in prayer. They know the source of their power. Lord, teach us to pray. The, the, the reason that we, we should say, Lord, teach us to pray is because prayer is not something that comes natural to us. Prayer is, is the habit of Jesus, but also that prayer is sweet communion with God. Now, these disciples, they were no slouches to prayers. No, that they, they was very much a habit of their life. Good Jewish individuals would have prayed quite often. They would have prayed when they woke up. They would have cited the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, and then they would have prayed. When they went to bed, they would have recited Deuteronomy 6, recited other things, and they would have prayed. Good Jewish individuals, they'd have prayed at the fixed times of prayer, three times a day. They would have prayed before they ate and after they ate. I've had some food I should have prayed after I ate for God to help me. <laughs> they prayed before meals and after meals. Historians record that on average in Jesus' day, these Jewish disciples would have probably have prayed three hours on average a day. That's a lot of prayer. There are no slouchers to pray at all. They, they were people who practiced prayer. But maybe their prayers have become routine, ritualistic, just a habit. They missed the real intimacy. They watched as Jesus prayed. And there was intimacy. There was power. There was something different in the way that Jesus prayed than the way they prayed. Now, part of that is because, well, Jesus is God's son. He's God in flesh. He's the son of God. He's been in heaven. And yet part of that is they missed the sweet communion with God that prayer is in their own life. Church, don't miss this. Prayer is an amazing opportunity for you to develop spiritual intimacy with the God of creation. Don't let this blow your mind too much, but think how awesome this is because of the death of of Jesus, because of his shed blood, when you pray, the God of the universe hears from little old us. Isn't that awesome? That, that, that is available. That is an amazing opportunity for us to develop intimacy with the Lord. And one of the things that I am fearful of is that we just know about God and that we don't know God's heart. We miss God's heart in prayer. See, the longer you've been in church, the longer that you've been a Christian, I mean, you can develop great knowledge about godly things. I, I, I want to commend many of you that, that are reading through the Bible. I made a commitment to read through the Bible in a year. I know three of us in our family are trying to read through the Bible this year in a year. I met a guy, um, or we have a church member who's been a church member, been saved five years, and in five years he's read through the Bible six times. Woohoo! Great thing. But my fear is if we just stop there, all we will do is just grow more knowledge about God. I don't want to know just about God. I want to know God. I want to know his heart. I want him to direct. I want him to guide. I want to know his, how he's leading. I want to know what his will is for our life. And an aspect of that, to know God, it is involved scripture. It does involve reading your word. It does involve corporate worship. But an important spiritual discipline is praying, seeking God's heart, sweet communion with God, where you ask, God, lead me, God, direct me, God, God, you move here. You see, prayer is something that's very vital to our lives. New Year's Day, I was working out, and uh, the lady leading the workout said, um, it takes 21 days to form a habit. 
And so then she whooped us all in a workout session. The habit I want to form now is skipping workouts. <laughs> uh, that's not what she was trying to do. 21 days to form a habit. So let me propose this to you. If you want to be like a disciple and you want to say, Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, I want to develop more intimacy with you. Lord, I want to know your heart. I want to be like one of the disciples. Lord, I want to know that sweet communion, Lord, and, and with God that you have. Let me, let me propose something to you. Will you commit to the Lord today for, Lord, I'm going to seek you 10 more minutes a day in prayer for the next 21 days, next three weeks. Maybe right now you're praying five minutes a day. So, Lord, I want to seek you 10 minutes a day. Maybe right now you're praying, if you're honest, not much today. Lord, I'm going to pre- seek you 10 minutes a day, 10 more minutes than what you're doing now, and say, Lord, I want to know your heart. Lord, teach me to have a greater intimacy with you. What do you think God might do? Here the disciples' heart. They were no slouches to prayer. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. It's prayer, sweet communion with God. Now, when we look as Jesus teaches here, the, we call the, the Lord's Prayer. It's probably more, more correctly labeled the disciples' prayer. As Jesus teaches us principles to prayer, in reality, what is Jesus teaching us? It's this. Prayer is our declaration of our declaration of dependent upon God is saying, God, I depend upon you. God, I need you. God, you take over. God, you lead. Now, the opposite of true, if prayer is my declaration of God, I'm depending upon you. Failing to pray or prayerlessness is my declaration, I don't need you, God. I got this handled. Now, can I tell you something? That's a fool. To think that we don't need God, to think that we got life handled, that we can do life on our own. God, we're good. Go somewhere else. You know, sometimes you ask people, okay, what can I pray for? I'm good. But to think that you're good and don't need God's help is foolish. And it'd be like this. A five-year-old who goes to their parents and says, you know what? I'm tired of you telling me when to go to bed. I'm tired of you telling me what to do and clean my room. I'm going to move out and run away. Now, what five-year-old can take care of themselves, can cook, can provide, can work? No five-year-old can take care. A five-year-old is foolish. Well, in a lot of ways, yeah. A five-year-old needs their parents' guidance. In the same way, friends, we desperately need the Lord. And so prayer is my declaration, God, I need you. And so the themes here is surrender. The themes here is for God's glory. The theme here is dependence upon God. And we look here, it's, as Jesus teaches us principles to prayer, it's, it's beginning by looking at God, reverence, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's, it's, it's putting the emphasis where it belongs, first on God. It's, um, it's uh, then surrender, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's request, it's both request for needs and, and relationships, it's it's God, um, give us our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who, who trespass against us. Look at all this tonight. Uh, it's renewed commitment. It's, it's, Lord, do not bring us into temptation, but God, lead us. I'm going to follow you, not into sin. As we look at the theme of just trusting upon the Lord, I want to look at one phrase in this prayer. You still with me, church? And here's the phrase. It's in verse 2. Your kingdom come. Here's a principle Jesus teaches us to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray in a way where we say, Lord, your kingdom come. Now think about when you pray that kind of heart, what you are saying. In some sense, you're saying, Lord, come quickly. Church, what a glorious day it will be when Christ returns. Glorious for the Christians, not so glorious for unbelievers. We are awaiting the return of King Jesus. We say, Lord, come. Lord, you, you come when God when he will establish his reign over all of creation. There will come a time when we won't need to pray this prayer anymore because he will already came and he is reigning on earth as he is in heaven. But in another sense, when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying for God's coming kingdom. But we also pray your kingdom come. We're praying for God's reign and rule in our hearts. In a sense, when you ask King Jesus to save you, When you turn from your sins and say, Lord Jesus, be my boss. Lord Jesus, save me. Be my God. 
he now reigns not just in heaven, but he reigns in your heart. And when you say, Lord, your kingdom come, you're saying, God, I surrender to you. God, reign in my heart. God, your will, your kingdom be what's first in my life. God, take over. God, reign. God, I surrender. God, I depend upon you. Jesus teaches us. This is the aspect in which we are to pray. It's, Lord, not my will, not my desires, Lord, but your will come over in my life. You know how hard that is? This is much easier to preach than it is to pray. You with me? We like what we like. I mean, I like sweet tea. I don't like unsweet tea. I like fried chicken. Grilled chickens for you health nuts. I like Braves baseball. We won't go there. We like what we like, right? And yet Jesus teaches us to pray, Lord, not what I like, but what you want. You know how hard that is? My wife and I this past month, um, we were praying together. We don't nearly pray together near enough. We were praying together, and I was probably crying, and I, I prayed something along this in the prayer time. Lord, I want, and I just told God my wants. You ever, God, I want. And I don't think it was even there in that prayer time. Maybe it was days later when I finally was able to say, Lord, I want. But not what I want, what you want is what I want to happen. I want to just be shoot straight with you. It's hard sometimes to pray your kingdom. But when you pray your kingdom comes, what you're saying is, Lord, I'm like a five-year-old. I have no business doing life on my own. I have no business trying to make the, Lord, I mess it up every time. Lord, not what I want. Lord, I depend upon you. Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done. You know how freeing that is? We're moving into an initiative, you've heard us talk about it, called Everyone Hears, where we desire for everyone to hear the gospel in Benton and Susser. We want no one left behind. But I want you to know, we cannot do this. Only God can do this. If we as a church don't gather together and say, God, we want everyone to know the gospel, but God, your will be done, Lord, you take over, it won't happen. This will be failed city. We've got to depend upon God. But how freeing it is to depend upon God. I had a church member who was very honest with me this past week. God had blessed in a way, and they just told me kind of their history. They said, you know what? We, um, I've been really mad at God at our circumstance lately. And I finally quit getting mad at God and say, God, you know what? I just trust you. I try to understand the circumstance. I just trust you. He said, ever since I just turned it over to God and just trusted him, she, um, church member said, God's provided one thing after another. And we just celebrated how God had provided another thing. As they trusted God in a hard situation. Man, it's good. Hard. Good. To say, God, your kingdom come. You know, sometimes we teach children how to pray. We teach them to recite prayers. I remember a prayer my parents taught me. God is great. God is good. Let us thank us for the food. Something, something else, let's eat. Did you learn those children's prayers? It's good to teach a child how to pray. Sometimes through routine. But it's bad when you're 50 and you're still praying, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for food. You know? God doesn't want us just to recite, he wants our heart. The disciples, maybe they were stagnant, maybe they were routine, maybe they just missed the intimacy. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. I wonder if you're honest before God today. Is there a hunger in your heart that says, Lord, teach me to pray? Lord, I want to be humbly. God, I, I want to know you more. I want to, be, I, I, want, I want to have that sweet communion with you more. I, I want to know your will. God, I don't, I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to be that five-year-old who thinks they can do life on their own. God, I want your ways, Lord. Teach me to pray. Is there a hunger in your heart for something more? For God's will to reign in your life? A few moments, we're going to vote to call Pastor Casey, and God, hopefully God will lead you where to vote for Pastor Casey to be our next student pastor. I want to tell you a story about him, one of the reasons why the search team loves him so much and brings him to you today. As we talked and, and, and met Pastor Casey through one of our interviews, we found out uh, while he was serving at this other church in Texas, 
He was at, at, there for a, a time. He was over the middle school students on Sunday night. He had 40-something middle school students that he kind of led or helped lead on, on Sunday nights. And he fed them pizza. The other high schoolers were at homes, but he had the middle school students at church. And he fed them pizza every Sunday night for a year straight. My six-year-old daughter thought that is the most glorious thing she could ever think of. <laughs> she thought that was heaven on earth. Well, Pastor Casey kind of felt bad they had pizza, or maybe he got tired of eating pizza for a year straight every Sunday night, and he hungered for something more. So he went to his, hopefully I'm telling the story right, he went to his roommate, seminary roommate, and they're both in seminary, new seminary roommate, and says, hey, I want to offer something more to our students. Can we sacrifice our budget, and can we, can we cook, can we, can we provide the food, money for the middle school students on Sunday nights? And for a year and a half, two poor seminary students paid for and cooked supper on Sunday nights, not pizza, for 40 middle school students. I appreciate that. Two 20-year-olds says, we want something more. Now, why you want something more than pizza, I don't know. <laughs> Unless it's fried chicken. We want something more. And because we want to offer something more, we're willing to sacrifice because we want something Church, are you here today? And if you're honest, do you want a deeper intimacy with King Jesus? Do you want to know his heart even more? Do you want to be more sensitive even more to when there's sin in your life? Do you want to know even more what God's desires are for you? It involves reading scripture. It involves part of church worship. It involves, Lord, teach us to pray. Would you say today, Lord, will you teach me to pray even more? Can we bow our heads and pray? Would you bow your heads and pray? I want you to ask, Lord Jesus, this is known quietness of the service tonight, this morning. Would you be very honest about your prayer life, your intimacy with the Lord, your closeness with the Lord? If it's not what you would think pleases the Lord or not what you want, we just ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me from drifting from you. Lord, forgive me, Lord, for my sin. Lord, forgive me, Lord, for thinking that you're not a good, good father. And would you, in the quietness of the moment, would you say, Lord, teach me to pray. Maybe today you're going to make a commitment to a greater intimacy in pursuing Jesus. Maybe you'll make a commitment today for 10 more minutes of prayer. Maybe you'll make a commitment just to the Lord. Lord, I just want to I just want to seek after you, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. I want your kingdom come. However God's leads, will you just pray? Ask God to lead in your life. Oh, Lord, you are good. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in our lives, Lord, as we seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to our invitation time, a time we invite you to respond as King Jesus spoke to you. Maybe today you want to just, your response is singing of your commitment. So in a second, sing. Maybe your response today is you want to come and con continue to surrender, continue to make commitments, continue to pray. And so the altar is open. You can come and pray. Maybe today you've been visiting our church and you want to become a member. If you're a Christian, we'd love for you to walk down the aisle and say, Pastor, I want to be a part of what God's doing here. I want to join the church family. Or maybe today you want to ask King Jesus to save you. We'd love for you to walk down the aisle and we'd love to have a to say, just say, I want to be saved, and we'd love to have a counselor share with you how Christ can do that in your life. As God speaks, will you respond? We stand together and sing. You come, you honor the Lord. Have thine own way. Watch me. Too. 
share with you uh, what God is doing and so we had a little kid that came forward that wants to be saved it's chatting with my wife right now uh, and we've got some others to share with you uh, in a second um, um, so uh, Patty I know I got you and Linda just sat down let me have you come back and stand back up here with me uh, Miss Linda this is Patty Drysdale her mother Linda Glenn Linda's um, blind um, and we are so excited about it. they've been coming it said New Year's Day for two years uh, we have done uh, we love both of these ladies very, very much. And they come today, wish to become members of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Yes. I am so, so excited. One of the things I so love about both these ladies, I know Patty, she's always bringing people with her to uh, the church and, and uh, working with things. And that I'm so excited about today. I'm so, so excited about today. And Pastor Michael's going to chat with you all about that. Take your picture and celebrate. So I'll let you, oh, Miss Francine's going to, you get you moved up. You got Miss Francine. Ms. Francine, if you'll take them and chat with them, they're fantastic. Uh, well, um, if you are new here, we are so thankful you are here with us. If you'll bear with us just a few moments, we're going to have some family business together, okay? Pastor Michael, might be able to take Ryan and Michaela uh, to the office today. We don't get to do this very often. Today, with great excitement, we get the opportunity to vote to call Pastor Ryan Casey to be our next student pastor. So if you're a member, I'm going to ask ushers to give a ballot to every member that's here. And so if you're a member... Uh, if you'll just, uh, they pass it out, if you'll grab one. We'll just give them a second. Y'all go ahead and start passing that out, ushers. They've got pins as well. It's an exciting time for us in the life of our church. We got four ushers in the main floor, but Coach Rod Schertz is all by himself in the balcony. He's laughing, you guys. So on the ballot, um, it says, I believe that Emmanuel Baptist Church should call uh, Ryan Casey to be our next student pastor. And so if you believe that answer is yes. Uh, we ask you to mark yes. If you believe that's no, we ask you to mark no, uh, as God has led you. And so we want to make sure everybody gets a ballot. It got hot in here, didn't it? Some of you said it didn't get hot until you started preaching, Sammy. <laughs> oh, yeah, it means it's hot. Uh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Exciting time for us. We want to thank you for bearing with us, but we want to make sure everyone gets a chance or every member makes sure that if you want to vote, we want to give you an opportunity to vote. You know, some churches... Back in the old days, they vote on the pastor every year. That would be no fun. Luckily, we just vote once. Everyone get one? Hey, Jerry, I think we still have some up front. You might want to help us. But after you get your ballot, I'm going to ask you if you'll take it, and you will fold it in half. And then if you'll pass it to the aisles, take it and fold it in half. 
and pass it to the aisles. Thank you for bearing with us. Make sure the ushers get all of the ballots. Now the, uh, the ushers are going to count them just real, real quickly, and I hope that I have an exciting announcement for you in just a few moments. Here's what we're going to do. If you're willing, uh, we're going to sing just a song or two. Um, as they count, it won't be very long, and then we hope to make a presentation to you in just a second. So if, you'll, um, if you're willing, we're going to sing just a song or two. I'm going to go touch that thermostat as well as we sing. You're going to mess with the thermostat? This might be a first a for me. brave man. <laughs> ben says don't touch. <laughs> they lock the thermostat. It might be locked for me. I'm going to see if I can touch the thermostat, okay? I'll be right back. Stay seated. Let's sing. There is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storm may come, I am whole.
So we'll keep singing. so thrilled to, to be a part of your body, and we look forward to getting to know each of you in the days ahead. Um, part of our heart is not just for the student ministry, it's for the church at large, and so we really look forward to getting to know you and serving alongside of you for however, for however the Lord wills in the days ahead. Um, please be in prayer for us. This is a great day, but it's also a sad day because we're going to be leaving some family. <laughs> Between the two of us, I'm the emotional one. <laughs> So we've got great friends, great family in Texas, so we're going to be leaving them, so please be in prayer for us, but we really are thrilled and we really are excited to be here with you guys in the days in the end. Amen. Amen. Such exciting times. Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, you to stand with us. Pastor John's going to close us in prayer, and then uh, the Casey's and I will be at the back door for you to greet them. We're going to sing that chorus again as our closing. And all the people said, Amen. Whoa. 